Welcome to the Economic Rockstar Podcast with your host, Frank Conway. Connecting brilliant minds in economics and finance. Hello and welcome back to another episode of the Economic Rockstar Podcast. In this week's episode, I speak with David Zetland. And he was a previous guest on the show back on episode 39 in June 2015. And he's come back on the show to update us on his recent work that he's done on climate change project Light Plus Two Meters, which is a collaboration with many different people and the majority non-academics. Also, you'll find out in this episode some of his recent work, including a paper called Water Civilization, the Evolution of the Dutch Drinking Water Sector, which gives us a recent history, well, 150 years of addressing drinking water system problems and the solutions that the Dutch have come up with, which gives us insights for improving drinking water services elsewhere. The first 30 minutes of this episode is just a general conversation between myself and David. If you prefer to skip it and move on, you might like to go on and start about 30 minutes later, where we actually talk about climate change and water scarcity. But if you'd like to hear our conversation, it's more so a catch up what we've been doing since we've last spoken to one another. A little bit of why I kind of stopped doing the podcast for about a year and also his reasons why he's shutting down his blog after 10 years, which is called agronomics.com. And I suppose to sum up why we've done this is what's common to both of us is burnout. This conversation with David was actually one hour and 40 minutes long. So I decided to condense it into the one hour audio, which is typical of this weekly episode. And I will make the rest of the interview available to Patreon listeners to access immediately. And if you'd like to access the rest of the interview, visit patreon.com forward slash economic rockstar. But the rest of this interview will be made available shortly on my website, economicrockstar.com forward slash podcasts. Or you can check out all the other platforms which will be made available for free, such as iTunes, Stitcher Radio and Spotify. Again, if you're a fan of the podcast and you listen on iTunes, I'd appreciate an honest rating and a review. That will rank the podcast higher and will get more listeners that way. Or if you want to show your appreciation in another way, you can check out the Patreon page and contribute at least a dollar a month. You can opt out of that at any time. There's no commitments whatsoever. And again, thanks very much for all those people who have become patrons of the podcast and it's much appreciated. Thanks very much. So again, enjoy this episode with David and myself. And it's great that this episode is coinciding with Water Week 2018, which runs from the 19th to the 24th of March. Oh, there you are. Hey. How are you keeping it? <laughs> <laughs> I'm just trying to make out, is that an XY on your flag or an XX? XXX. All oh, three X's. Ooh, yep. saucy. <laughs> yeah. Well, they were they were saucy before it was even saucy. It's, well, uh, <laughs> it's supposed to be like the church and the, another church or whatever. So, okay. Yeah. They uh, now it's now it just stands for porno as far as people are concerned. Yeah, that's it. Yeah, so uh, this will get quite explicit. <laughs> <laughs> just in case we were wondering. Yeah, I actually admired that um, the ceiling and all the last time you were, we were talking to each other. Yeah, I like the, the, the you know it's it's, it's still it's nice. still there. Yeah, with our our thick beams in the summertime when it gets hot, the 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 tar from the roof melts through the cracks and falls on the floor here. So wow. that's uh. You know, climate change is going to make our our roof very unstable. <laughs> we'll have to look for alternatives then. Um, oh yeah, the tar exactly. there. So, yeah, yeah, it's good to see you again, David. You know, I yeah, long a, time. I took a break for a while. You know, it was pretty much a year. Yeah, it was pretty much a year. Yeah, uh, and I see with your email that you're going to stop doing the blog. Is it? You have two of them. Yeah, yeah. I'm. I'm. Um. You know, it's almost ten years. Like, in fact, next Monday will be the tenth anniversary. Wow. So I'm I'm going to write a, vic, a a post that's you know declares victory, and I'm going to say more or less, um, yeah, the, the 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 blog is dead. Long live the blog, because I'm going to kind of uh, say that the this ten years of blogging has been helpful in all kinds of ways, and I'm going to put out a book called The Best of Agronomics because yeah. there's no human out there that has ever read all of these posts, hmm. and if you set them to six thousand posts, they would just you know kill you immediately, yeah. but a book would be a nice way for me to kind of close up that chapter. Mm -hmm. And then I want to turn around and start a new project um, probably in the fall because I'm starting to be mature about not rushing around all the time uh, and, and burning myself out, which is Uh, uh, what I happened to me. Yeah. (laughs) It's a problem. eh? Yeah. Um, And so I'm like, yeah. So 
I could tell you another story about how I, I did this uh, climate change book and I and I finished it like I was like finishing it on like December 20th. And, you know, as we're going to the airport, I'm hitting send and ship and publish and crap. And then and then it was and I was done. I'm like, I came back in January. I'm like, OK, let's start the next one. It's like, what? And I, what, yeah. what was it? And, and by the way, start the next one and we'll we'll finish the fundraising by the end of February. And then, you know, and was, I was just so crazed about hurry up right yeah and then i was like okay no 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 wait i i had a i had a, a, a epiphany called don't be an idiot and then i was like i can do this and i think i ended up doing the the fundraising by the end of may and then i collected stories until september and then i proofread and, and i get fucked again at the end of last year so that was the first book was end end of 2016 the second book was the end of 2017 and then, uh, but I got fucked up because the 35 stories by the authors were actually not really that well proofread or edited. Yeah. And so I just ended up working like five days straight editing all these stories, pissing off all the authors because I was just brutal. I, I was cutting their shit by like a third or 40% sometimes. But in the end, they agreed. And then I got the book done again, like pretty much on December 20th. Oh, no, no, no. Actually, I couldn't get it done because I couldn't get the author's done in time. I'm like, okay, guys, I'm going to vacation. I'll see you in January. Yeah. And nobody minded that. So it was all me and my bright ideas, you know, that's burning me out. Mm. And that's the book that you have. That's, so I have, let's see. So this is the, this is the first one, Life Plus Two Meters. Yes. And this is the second one, Volume oh, wait, Two. Oh, oh, wait, oh, wait. Okay. I saw that one. That's this with is the 34 the orders in it. So that's the so second one. So I use one. this logo all the time. On the website, and this, and so this was the cover of the first book, and this is the cover of the second book. Okay, okay. And, then, and you got uh, that done in um, the two years, really, sixteen and seventeen. Yeah. So, so the first one was published at the end of sixteen, yeah. and the second one was published at the end of seventeen. Yeah, that, that's a, that's a lot of hard work, isn't it, David? Oh, and well, with the, yeah, with running the blog and then teaching as well at the university. All, all of the above, like it's um, writing papers, teaching plus the blogging. Plus, I had other projects, and I was like, you know, so in terms of getting my time back, I, I had this, I had this thing on my wall. It says, uh, "You might appreciate this." No, yes, yes, that should be your password into anything, you, your bank account, and everything. Just to remind exactly. yourself. Yeah, exactly. You know, do not do extra projects. So I'm literally uh, this morning. I was going through emails that someone sent, people sent me in 2016 that were in my. And earlier, like 2016 is a fair number, like, oh, I should write about this. It's like, yeah, yeah, I'll get to it. Mm. And here I am two years later getting to it. And that's just stupid, right? Mm. So that's why I'm, I'm number one, not taking on new projects so I could finish off those old things. Yeah. And then number two, it's like once I catch up with that, I am going to be, I, I hope, more careful about adding more stuff to my pile because it's there's there's – there's of course there's almost no financial gain. It's all stuff I do for free. I, I that's uh, what I was just going to say because I checked it out on Amazon and on your website, and the book yeah. is one dollar on Kindle. Yeah, it's four dollars on Amazon as a paperback, and it's free yeah. as a PDF download. And so yeah. was your first book on I think it was Agronomics, wasn't this the first book? Or so the first yeah the first book is I have my whole library up here. I have the this one was was twenty bucks that was or ten dollars. Yes, that's the thick one. Yes, and then I rewrote that. And this one, which is a thin one, and that's free now, PDF. Called Living with Water Scarcity. Yeah, water that's, scarcity. Right. that's one we were talking about. Yeah. And and then I said, you know, free books, because I, I originally was gonna sell this for five bucks and they and I sold like three hundred copies. I'm like, well that's good, but this is not what I want. Mm. And then I said free to download, and that was to me a a, 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 a realization like I'm not gonna make any money off of this. Mm. You know, uh, especially with the amount of time I spend. So I might as well go for readers. Yes, yes. And then when it came to doing the Spanish version, which curiously has Spanish on it, I uh, I got volunteers to to do the translation. And because I was already giving the book away, they would work for free and, and I would give it away and they were OK with that. Mm. So it's, if I was going to try and sell it, it would fuck everything up, basically. Like it's a, like there's a couple of things I want to mention there. Like firstly, I had a, a guest, I think it was he was number seven, seven or eight, maybe even five, Andrew Heaton. And he has his own blog. And he decided, like what you're suggesting there with your 10 years, you know, of agronomics, he put all his posts into this book. And I actually bought the book. Mm -hmm. I don't know, something about, I think communist is in the title. 
and he mm-hmm. does all those stickman drawings and all that. He's a comedian with economic right. games. And he was able to put that, and it's better, like, not better, but it's handy for those people who want to have the book and not be online all the time or on their phone and oh, to be yeah. able to pick up. And it's, Kindle is great. You know, yeah. you know, every, technology is great, but sometimes yeah. it's nice to have a book that if you want to, a reader to dip into your uh, blog and you know they bought the book, well, it's great to have that access rather than trying to um, – I don't anyway. I don't know whether you do – find out how many visits you get per month. Maybe at the beginning, oh, yeah. I was kind of watching these things, but just exactly. you know, not anymore. You know, yeah, I've, I've, I've given up. It's just like, it's a fool's errand, right? Yeah, yeah. And then uh, the the other thing I was just going to say there, oh, no, it's gone. Um, it's gone. You, just, you show me gone, the book. Gone traveling. Gone, yeah, it's gone. Gone walkabout. <laughs> yeah, but that's it. But um, no, sure, look at it as well as that. You just have to look after yourself as well, you know? Yep. And I, I know there's so many downloads on this because I can look at my uh, statistics on the host that I have this podcast on. Uh, right. I don't I don't know on iTunes how many I have. All I know is from a bar if it's a, a popular episode. Popular which, yeah. yeah, but that that's kind of comes and goes on a weekly basis. So what was once really popular a year ago doesn't have that kind of those bars like a like a battery bar or such. Right. But, you know. If I do this and it goes out to, I know this sounds cliche, to a handful of people and, and they enjoy it, fine. You know, that that's good for me. It's great for me, you know, that it's um, that I'm getting listens. Right. Because I, at the time, I did enjoy it up to a certain point where I felt that I wasn't, I was doing it for the sake of doing it and kind of yep. trying to put myself under pressure to have somebody on a, 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 the next Thursday and the Thursday after. Yeah. And things, you know, you suffer for, for it. So I kind of took a step back. Didn't know whether I was going into it, and someone got you got you actually got in touch with me first a mm-hmm. couple of months back about the book, and I remember saying to you that look at the moment I'm not doing anything again yes. for the foreseeable future, and then someone else got in touch with me who I also had on the podcast previously, Robin Hanson, and yes. I said look at you know this is the second person there's perhaps a, a, a need for it to to keep it going, and I'll give it a shot, and I you know this is where we are at now you know so but how's it going for you? It's going good, yeah. It's going good. Still the, the pressure, you know, to get the next guest on. I feel very comfortable here now having our conversation. I don't know whether it was when I started earlier on, I was maybe a little bit more uptight, uh, trying to read up people's research. You know, you do a lot of, you, you're on, it's one man show. Like I compare yeah. myself, say, to, for example, a talk show host on a, a TV program or on radio, and they have a support network, you know, they have editors, they have uh, yeah, researchers yeah. and um, but also they, they, they also have uh that's their full-time job right? yeah that's their full-time job yeah and you're like you're trying to teach and then you're like oh by the way i have this whole full-time job <laughs> yeah. and you know um russ roberts does econ talk right yes, yes i think that's all he does i think he's like yeah i read your book and you know i mean he does other stuff but he doesn't have a job he doesn't teach no and and as far as i know yeah and it's a great website because they uh, provide the transcripts oh my god yeah I he's, got a, he's got a sound engineer, he's got a transcript writer, he's got a, a subsidy, he's got like a team and you're like, I'm trying, I mean, I, what you're talking about is so clear, it's so exactly my experience because I was trying to do this thing called the circus, which was a monthly meetup for entrepreneurs. Mm-hmm. And I was like trying to get some, I get, I needed two speakers every month. And I was like, just chasing people around trying to get speakers. It's like, mm-hmm. why am I doing this? Right. <laughs> uh, and then the worst, the, the, the end of the story was, I had 45 people signed up to co- show up to this thing. I, I had some guy coming from, from Amsterdam to The Hague, which is like I, – I work I live in Amsterdam. I work in The Hague. So it's like a 40-minute train ride. Someone's coming. 40 people are signed up, and then like three people showed up. And I was like, I'm done with this shit. I, I am not going to kill myself for this kind of treatment, whatever yeah. you want to call it, or lack of interest. And I was so happy when I ended that. <laughs> and, then, and then someone's like, oh, it's so bad that you're ending it. Can we help? I'm like, yeah, go ahead, take it. It's yours, yeah, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, and and they're like, oh well, maybe not, right? Yeah. So it's like you realize how much work you're doing when you real when you see that how nobody wants to pick up that much work that you want to hand over to them, right? Mm. They're just like, nah, oh, way too much, right? So mm. you know, but it's great when you get the feedback as well from people who reach out to you. Like when I took a, a break there, pretty much immediately, I had a few people emailing me or messaging me directly on Facebook or Twitter or saying, look, it's great. They had the show and saying they made decisions based on what they listened to on the podcast. And I felt I owed it to them as well to to continue this on. But I also have a Patreon page. I don't know if you ever heard of Patreon. Yeah, yeah, I've heard you. How is that going? 
It's going, look, it's going okay. I had it for over, oh, geez, I said I have it over two years. And I didn't want to mention it because I, didn't, I don't like asking for funding, right. you know. And I, right. I just don't like it because this is what, it's not what the podcast is all about. I, I'm sorry, I, I feel I'm talking about myself. Here. No, no, but this, pod, I'm curious because, uh, yeah, but I, I think it's, I, I think that you're doing, you're, you're introducing, like now you're talking about it. Mm. And I think you do it in a, a very, uh, how do you call it? A non-aggressive way, yeah. in a very good way to do it. It's like, hey, you know, it's free. You even say it like several times. I really want you to enjoy it. But by the way, you know, yeah, and it's like- only out there. That's what it's all about. You know, the, the freemium. Um, well, oh, that's what I was going to ask you earlier on. Actually, I, I said I slipped my mind for a moment, and it was all that the, the whole model of providing songs and music and whatever else, uh, books for free, and the pressure right. to do that. But um, yeah, with Patreon. I just, I just don't, I, I wouldn't like to ask for money because that's not what this was all set up to be for either. But like, what well, as you said, Russ Roberts has a team behind him. I'd yeah. like to be able to get a small team behind me yeah. so that yeah. I can pump out these uh, high quality episodes, provide them. Like what we're doing right now is a video format. Like there's no reason why I can, if, as long as it's agreeable to you, put this mm-hmm. on YouTube because people like seeing video. Mm-hmm. When they're mm-hmm. listening to podcasts, like I have these automatically going onto YouTube, but with no mm-hmm. uh, visual, just right. a, a logo, and right. that doesn't. And I, I wouldn't expect it because I wouldn't do it either. Listen to this episode unless there's a, a communication between uh, two or more people. Uh, yeah. So like that, now the pre- the Patreon there is to for me to get these transcripts or whatever else is going to be ad- adding value to the overall overall experience for the listener. Yeah. I think you're, I think you're like at least 80% there with just audio, right? Yeah. The transcript is for sometimes I want to look at something. I do a word search on the, mm. on the, on the audio on the transcript. But that's like very unusual. Even comments are like, you know, fun, but not necessarily interesting. And video, I think is the same because like, you know, we're doing a head, a fate, a, a talking heads thing, right? Yeah. If, if we were like, you know, running around kicking a football, that might be interesting for the video. Yeah. But, um, I think, I mean, honestly, I think you're, you're, you're very much, you've got most of the main things in place in terms of just the audio. And if you wanted to hire folks, then, uh, um, I, I, I wouldn't know where to, obviously you should do it, whatever it is to make your life easier, but it would, yeah. I, I couldn't say that like, oh my God, this is missing a transcript because that's. No, that uh, wouldn't be a priority at all. Yeah. I mean, I, 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 and I listened to about four or five different podcasts and they really do fit in this kind of time of day when I'm, you know, literally doing the laundry or I'm riding my bike. Yeah. And I can't read. And when I can read, I'm not interested in podcasts or videos. Yeah. Although my girlfriend and I know many younger people are like videos, 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 because they don't want to read anything. And that to me is just like sad in a way. So, I mean, I, 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 I think you're, you're doing great with, with this format. And mm-hmm. I also think it's great to get some, some Patreon money because that's like, you know, maybe it's just beer money, but it's it's nice. It's a, it's good to appreciate to be appreciated, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. What I'd love to be able to do, and I, I'm sure this is something that I'm not on my own when it comes to an economist or someone who teaches economics, is to do up some videos, online tutorial videos, like, because they're, yeah. it's, it's, they're somewhat easy to do, but you want to kind of get polish them off as well, so that, not that you want them animated, but I think it helps to get, get that to be able to do something like that for economics to animate diagrams or what have you. Mm-hmm. So there, there's that. And there's also like what you showed me a sign there it says no new projects for 2018. And this is all on my head, all these projects. And one of them is I'd like to do another type of podcast, which mm-hmm. is independent to this, but still economic team, but based on the type of format that, you know, Serial and S-Town has. And I don't know if you ever heard those kind of uh, real life, uh, episodes no. or podcasts. Oh, so or are you are you chatting with people like uh, no, real it's, folks? It's, yes, there's interviews and it's a story and it's kind of building up to maybe eight to t- ten, twelve episodes and mm-hmm. see where it takes the the listener and uh, brings draws them into the, kind of a real life story. Uh, oh, right. One I'd like to do on that. You know, I've made contact with somebody who and the family of somebody who who would like to be able to do a kind of a, a serial type. Um, mm-hmm. episode two and that's what i i didn't stay specifically what that is on patreon but i just did mention that i'd like to get to hit a certain mark so i can be able to do so and i'd like to be able to travel to do these interviews too you know right. if, if, they, if if need be 
you know. So does that mean kind of like a, a ten part series in a way? Yeah, once I mean, off ten part series. You're one developing series. the story over these things. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It'd probably be just one series, like a one once off podcast, like serial. Yeah, you know, yeah. Or a shit town, so, you know? so if I was if I was in your shoes, I would I would make this kind of a summer project, and then yeah. you know take a break from yeah. the regular podcast because you can't you can but you shouldn't double up on your workload yeah 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 and and you say and i say people like i'm like taking my i'm I'm american but i'm like i'm taking my vacations european styles like i'm i'm gone for august or Mm -hmm. i'm gone for christmas you know you can read something else don't have to read my blog (laughs) and i've I've never gotten any objections from Mm -hmm. this you know and that's the thing like like i saw when i was looking up your work there i didn't realize you had a second blog um, and I, I just found your KYSQ. Um, yeah. What's it called? Kiss your status quo or kill your status quo? Yeah, kiss it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> kiss, your, kiss it goodbye. That's yeah. the one you're holding on to, though, is it? Oh, Maybe no. I, that's, <laughs> but that, that uh, uh, URL I've had longer than anything. That's my personal yeah. site. Okay. So I don't blo- – and, and when I will be blogging on the next blog, the name I'm holding on to is One-Handed Economist. Okay. And, and what and does that's, that uh, mean, One-Handed haven't you heard? You heard that there was a, there was a story from um, uh, Harry Truman was the president in, in the U.S. after World War II, and uh, he's like, uh, "Look, I've got all these economist advisors, and they say on the one hand you should do this, on the other hand you should do that. All I want is a one-handed economist." Uh, and so the the my my intention here is that the one-handed thing is where I basically say. You know, the law of demand is called a law of demand because it's reliable. And this is, there's no second hand, there's no other hand. This is what we need to talk about. When prices go up, people demand a, a lower quantity. When prices go down, they demand a higher quantity. This is it. And then, you know, fight with all comers, basically. But the idea is to, to not be, uh, on the one hand, the other hand, or to not say pros and cons or costs and benefits, but just say, this is it. But you can't avoid that, though, can you? I was just after coming out of a lecture there before I met with you, and I was teaching options, call options yeah. and black schools, option pricing model, and there's advantages and disadvantages to options, and likewise with futures. And like but that, you if, might you say, had, if you had to say a, a, a one-handed comment on options, what would it be? As in, like you, should, a, you cannot dispute this comment. Well, I'd have to, I'd have to look at the negative side of. Oh, well, you can't no, dispute no. it. Well, okay, so the, what you can't dispute is that you have to pay a premium for to buy a call option. Or you, what you can't dispute is that an option gives you choices. Yes, you can either exercise or abandon. Right, so, so that's why we love options, because they give you choices. Mm. And yeah, of course, uh, now you have a problem, you have to make a choice, but the, 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 what we love about options, the, the one-handed aspect of it is that we like choices. Mm. And to not have that choice, to not have that option is worse than to have that option. Okay. So there you go, right? And then I can even use this. I can make you a guest uh, a blogger on this one because when the government says you can't short the market, they take away choices, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And then they're and then they end up effing up the market because uh, you know uh, those 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 short signals, those sell signals, are actually quite valuable in terms of market information. Mm. I I don't actually understand why they did that in Europe as well. They actually banned short selling as if it's, short as if the short sellers were to blame for the stock market crash. Yeah, exactly. It was that's the like, buyers like inflation blaming. to a high level. Oh, it's 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 like Donald Trump kind of economics, really. It's like you know, oh, I'm gonna stop people from getting fat by banning forks. You know, it's like they'll find a way. They'll use a spoon. You know, it's not exactly that hard. Or so, we're, we're going to stop the drug trade, opiates heading into the U.S. by building the wall. Yeah, exactly. They're exactly. coming other ways, like. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. I'm sure. So some people are not so clever. Yeah. So. Um, other than that, um, how are you keeping yourself? Oh well, with... now that now that I have my simpler life, it's good. Yeah. Uh, You're chopping teaching... wood and everything, are you? <laughs> hey, chopping wood out back and all the store up for the yeah, market. yeah, yeah. Um, no, Amsterdam is fantastic. I'm yeah. I I think I don't know if we talked uh, when the last time it was we were on air or we talked, but I was for a little while. I, my girlfriend and I we moved back to Canada and then decided that was not good. We moved back to Amsterdam. And after I moved back to Amsterdam, then I was like, okay, I'm going to live here. I'm going to buy a flat, this flat. So when we talked before, it was this flat. So you, we definitely talked. And I'm going to get a stay here. I'm just going to be a, uh, an immigrant to the Netherlands from the U.S. And so all of that is going well. Donald Trump has made my decision much more easy. Shit, yeah. <laughs> Fuck. 
and my job is fun and you know so on so it's 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 i'm 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 doing quite well quite well i'm really really pleased david uh the, your episode with me number 39 was aired on july 2nd 2015 all right okay and i moved in here in uh january 2015 so i think uh we talked uh, briefly a month or so yeah. before that and you're on the russ roberts podcast actually before me <laughs> before you came on to mine i mean yeah yeah uh, yeah 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 that's, yeah, right, that's yeah. right yeah so i think you kind of covered in a way why you're shutting down your blog after 10 years or is there any other reason why you're doing that other than you know putting it out there in book format and the fact that you're taking on new projects and you want to kind of look after your other things you know yeah i mean, I, I love blogging but i think that you know you you you, in some ways you could do it forever, but I, I find my, you know, when, when people write a, say a newspaper column for 30 years, yeah. you know, they don't necessarily say, go read what I wrote 22 years ago. And in the blog, it's not the same because it's about ideas, not so much news. And so in some cases, I'm going back to blog, uh, blog posts from 2008 and so on. And so that's why I decided to kind of shut it down because the archive is just unmanageable. Yeah. So, uh, you know, I just... Uh, sticking in a recharger and it's not taking it oh yeah okay sorry about that david well housekeeping you lost mm -hmm. your earbuds there we go there there are eight sockets there and i got to the eight one <laughs> <laughs> that sounds like uh sounds like the uh the uh what do you call it the maintenance crew has not been paying attention <laughs> Yeah, so so I, so I was telling you that the the blog. So that there's a couple of reasons why I've shut down the blog. One is that it's like the archive is just massive. The other one is that I kind of find myself saying the same thing over and over again about water stuff. And I'm you know this one-handed economist thing is much more broad than mm -hmm. just water and environment. Yeah. The other one is that uh, yeah, I I find that that daily grind of the blog is is not necessarily a great thing. So that's that's that. And then I think I like blogging, so that's why I do want to switch to another kind of blog. And I, I can't say that I like I like I'm going to do less blogging because I want to do more research because I don't want to do that. Mm. But it's, it's, I think more it's also just like lowering the number of hours I work on things so that I have more time for you know just I guess what the Dutch would call like living your life, you know, because they get they get off of work and they just they don't think about work. They're done. They they go home and they you know make dinner at six o'clock and you know, read the paper and shit. So it's like, I'm kind of liking that idea of, of, of slowing down a little bit and, and just, and you know, the best thing is, is that you can read a book, you can yeah. talk to somebody, you can go for a walk. It's like, holy shit. Like I live in Amsterdam. Why wouldn't I want to go for a walk? You know? Yeah. So this is a weird way of, of getting back control over my life also. Yeah. But when when you do have time out from it, you do kind of miss it. It's always on the kind of burning in the back of your mind, you know, to, to do something that's the way i felt anyway it's great then being able to start talking to people again like like yourself and recently you had say eugene fam and Fern and Smith, yeah you know very so, very impressive guest yeah. congratulations yeah thanks very much and I, I think it helps when you have a back catalog of people that are that are not not all of the same discipline not not the, of the same like I don't, this isn't the biased podcast either, you know, in terms of the content. So it's quite varied. And mm -hmm. I think it's great that um, all aspects of economics is hopefully touched on. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I mean, this is where, where people are like, oh, economics is all about money, right? Or it's all about markets. I mean, I give this lecture telling students about, you know, the difference between markets and society, right? And, and you can't, and there's some crazy, they say, oh, neoliberalism, blah, blah, blah. It's like, you know, neoliberalism is, is like, it, it's, it's, it's an oxymoron because you cannot have a market without having a society. You have to have rules and government and regulations and all that stuff. Mm. And so they're like, oh, the market is running the politics. Like, I don't think so. Yeah. And so in that sense, I, I think that the, uh, you know, just discussing the, the complexities of, of life using economic ideas is really the best you can hope for. Mm. Because if you just say, I'm going to talk about economics and, and, and we're not going to talk about anthropology or sociology, well, then you're an idiot because mm. all those other people have really good things to add on the exact same topic. And that's mm. what I really like actually where I work with this interdisciplinary work yeah. is that, you know, we've got not just scientists, but also other other social sciences. And it's and it's kind of cool 
a bit of a joke between us, like among us, like, oh yeah, you're just a sociologist, you know, what do you know? You're only talking about group groupthink. But it's nice to have other people around and 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 not just be in an economic echo chamber, which can get pretty, I don't know, bad. I was just writing a blog post today about how um because this guy wrote me a, uh, he was teaching with my book. He said, I couldn't use part two of your book. Part two is like the, so, the, the politics of water or the sociology of water. And he's like, we couldn't use part two because it didn't fit into the economic paradigm. I'm like, well, then you need to think bigger because mm-hmm. water has a lot of politics around it yeah. and it involves the community. And so I, I was explaining that in this blog post. So in that sense, I, I think that it's um, your show is good because you're, not only are there different strains of thinking in economics, but I, I, I really like it when you bring the, the traders on in because the traders like give no fucks about economic theory and most of the economic theory does not apply to what the traders are doing, right? Mm-hmm. Same as with marketing people. And that, that should be pointed out to a lot of academic economists that they're like missing a lot of the reality. And so that's, you know, you're doing well on that. Let's talk about your book, actually, where the guy said that he couldn't look at the second part and use it in his classes because it doesn't touch on the economics and the politics side. Is yeah. this the, the Life Plus Two Meters, Volume 2? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, no, 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 no. That's the, that's the, the both. Economics. By, are we being recorded, by the way? Or are you? Oh, this is all recording, and I don't mind if you want to leave it out. Or you, you oh, no, I, I'm, I'm just, as, as, I, as long as we're, as long as you're in charge of editing, that's not my problem. So, <laughs> <laughs> what, do you uh, want to leave something out there, do you? No, no, not at all, not at all. Oh, cool, uh, cool. Everything is in, even the, even the, the triple X flag. So, <laughs> cool. when, I, when I did End of Abundance, I was, I'm really not good with organization. So, yeah. when I first wrote this, the first draft of this, I threw out the second draft. I threw out almost 80% of it. The third draft, and these are this 80,000 words, right? So the third draft, I kind of bit the bullet and I did it again. And I found a scheme that I really liked. And the scheme was that I was going to organize the book in two parts. And the first part was going to be about water as a kind of an economic good. And, and, you know, we talk about excludable goods, right? Mm -hmm. So excludable goods, you can put a price on it. You can put property rights on it, but then you have another kind of good, which is a non-excludable good. And those you can't put a price on because everybody jointly owns it or uses it, like common pool goods and public goods, right? Mm. So my most common slide now for any presentation is showing this, this, these two columns of, of market goods and non-market goods or, or economics and politics. Mm. So the book is arranged into the economics of water, which is part one, and the politics of water, which is part two. And the, the, what I say is in the, in the introduction to the book, and I did this for the second book also, Living with Water Scarcity, what I say is we need to decide how we're going to allocate water to among ourselves as a social good. Like that's environmental water. That's water, mostly water that we don't want to put in a market. We put that water aside. So in Ireland, you'll say we want to have our marshes. We want to have our rivers. We want to have uh, all of this water that we all jointly consume potentially a human right discussion goes in here also and once you set that water aside then you allow the rest of the water to be allocated through market forces and prices then you allow capitalism to work then you did and then what you'll get is the much more efficient allocation of that water why uh, after you've protected the water that we all share mm. and so you cannot talk about markets for water and until you have already talked about the community water. And, and that's where people, uh, I think a lot of people get very upset about ec- economists saying, but what about the community? It's like, okay, we're going to take care of that. So that's why I, I structured the, the book in those two parts, because I wanted to acknowledge those two different and very important uses of water while kind of focusing on one at a time. Because if you, if you mix them all together, people freak out. You say, you know, water's a human right, water in the environment, bottled water, tap water, it's all a mess. And, and my job is to pull it apart so that we can talk about it one piece at a time and not get confused. And so that's why I did that structure in those, in those two books. Uh, when you were saying, uh, talking about that, all you could think about was, say, um, the use of fracking at the moment and how it's, go- sure. how it's going to affect, I don't know what that is, water underneath the ground. There's two major impacts of fracking. The first one is taking the water out of some location mm. so that you can inject it later on right so you might drain a river to frack or you might pump groundwater to frack then once you frack you're going to have the water coming back the the return what they call it return flows Uh, and that's not the same as produced water because when you drill an oil well you get water sometimes it's called produced water 
But when you frack, you get return water, and that's just full of crap, right? So it's it's full of the fracking solvents as well as potentially oil or natural gas contamination. And that, when it comes on the surface, that can contaminate surface waters. The thing that people worry about that is not so common is that you you frack and then you're going to contaminate an aquifer. That's yes. usually not a problem because the fracking layer is usually like way below, 500 meters a kilometer below the, the aquifer. So usually they drill straight through the aquifer and they and they encase that well so that it's sealed. Okay. And 99% of the time that works. Mm. There's of course 1% of the time when it doesn't work and and that gets a lot of people's attention. But the bigger risks from fracking are actually a depletion of local surface waters and the contamination of local surface waters. Mm. Can I ask you about the climate change project that you're undergoing? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, is this That's another one I finished, by the way. I, I declared victory on that. But anyway, yeah, yeah, that was until recently. This is the Life Plus Two Meters project that you're doing, isn't it? Exactly. And you have yeah. two volumes of that in a, in a book format. Yeah. And this is a is this a collaboration with 34 other people or there's 34 of you in total? Work no, this. there's there's uh, so in the first book, there's something like uh, I, I say roughly 60 people in total. So the first book had 29 visions from 27 authors and vision is the word I use. Right. Because it's this is all this is all uh, cli-fi. It's 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 science fiction about climate change. So it's <laughs> cli-fi. <really? laughs> so the, the, the people have these. And then the second one is 34 visions by 34 authors. So we have a total of over 60 authors. Yeah. And I was the editor. And I was like the, the chief cat wrangler, you know, trying to keep the cats in the room in the right corner and so on. So that was a massive management task, basically. And what was the reason behind I know the, the fundamental reason is to bring people's awareness of what's happening with climate change and that our water levels have gone up by two meters on average. Yeah. So the, 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 the two meters angle is just a kind of a catchy idea. Mm. All of the stories are supposed to be about how our life might be when the climate has already changed, right? Mm-hmm. So it's it's set in the, the future, the near future, the distant future, whatever. And the reason I wanted to use those stories in the future, this fiction, is because I wanted people to think about uh, how climate change might affect their lives so that they can s- d- decide what they want to do now or they can try and think about different worlds or different plans in the future, mm-hmm. And the reason I wanted to use so many different authors is because we have no idea how this is going to affect us. Yeah. Uh, from a scientific perspective, we have an okay idea, but from a social perspective, from an emotional perspective, from a political perspective, it's all over the place because God knows how we're going to respond to it. And the the shocks of climate change, I wrote a blog post, like someone said, oh, it's about two, li- two, li- uh, two meters higher sea level. I said, and they said, well, what about the other stuff? I'd like, I was like, no, no, I'm really interested in the other stuff. So at some places, it'll be too hot to, to go outside. In some places, the droughts will be 10 years that had never been there before. In some places, there'll be storms that are going to wipe out uh, uh, seaside villages. So there's so many different types of impacts of climate change. But I use that plus two meters thing just as kind of the brand as an overall theme. And are they coming from different disciplines, the Oh, yeah. Yeah. So this is what oh, yeah. you're on about. Like, it's good always to take a look at a sociologist or. Oh, it's, uh, it's way more diverse. The, the youngest author, I think, is 17. Wow. Uh, a high school student. Uh, the oldest author, I didn't ask their age, but I know retired. So say 70. Yeah. They're from probably I didn't also I didn't survey the countries, but I'd say the UK was probably the top country for contributors or the US, those two. But there are probably authors from a total of about. 15 or 20 countries. Very nice. Yeah. So the diversity of, of people's background, some of them were academics. Some of them, many of them were not academics. Which which is perfectly fine because we want to yeah. get from the experience as well of people who are actually living it and feeling it and exactly. being affected by it. Exactly. And and that makes for better writing, by the way, because mm-hmm. academics are not known for their <laughs> their prose. Yeah. You know, I, I mean, I read these stories. I'm, I, I'm, you know, it was a lot of work, but I'm still really impressed by the quality, the, the readability of the books. I mean, they're they're really nice to read. Out of all those chapters, I know you have a chapter in there yourself. I think it's on uh, risk insurance, is it? In the second was, volume. Yeah, like that. Yeah, um, yeah. Out, other than that, out of all of the, if you want to talk about that, we can. But what comes to mind as the one that stands out to you uh, that's maybe in your mind right now that 
is quite impressive. Pick your favorite child, they ask the mother. Yeah. <laughs> no loaded questions, Frank. So, um, and this see. is not being biased, but it's just something that is that was kind of you're kind of taken aback or you know surprised by or you know given whatever country it's coming from. Yeah, you know, there's. I I think that the a lot of the the story a couple of stories that just really come to mind I'm I'm just I was just paging through the second book were ones where people the authors are writing about a character who's being facing a uh, they're 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 being told to do what everybody else says they're to, being told to give up let's say and there's one story that I love is like this this woman is. Um, I, I won't say the the name because I I'll get tied up with the table of contents. But there's a a woman who is breaking up with her boyfriend, and he's like, "Why are you hanging out in the countryside, trying to st- uh, run a pub when everybody knows this this area is good, is is already flooded? It's it's a risky thing, et cetera, et cetera." And she's like, "You know, we have to stand for something. We have to try and make our own way in this world." And then, you know, she she drives her 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 boyfriend, her ex-boyfriend drives him to the to the train station and drops him off because she can't let him go on his own because he'll be kidnapped and killed because it's not safe in the countryside. But anyway, she she gets back and then and then this guy is standing in front of her, her little inn, her little cafe. And he's like, oh, I came yesterday and I brought all my friends because we really want to have sandwiches. And she's just like it's she's just validated for her own choice. Yeah. And. You know, it's like when we were just talking earlier about how if someone sends you an email saying, you know, thank you for what you're doing, your blog or whatever it is like that is they come out of nowhere, you know, mm-hmm. and and you, you put in work day after day. You have no idea if anybody cares. And then someone comes along and says, thank you. And it's like that's just the best it is, thing yeah. to have mm-hmm. in your inbox, really. Yeah. And so that was one story. Uh, I mean, there's other stories about refugee smugglers there's other stories about you know the sharks of manhattan the sharks of the new the new the wall street brokers you know mm-hmm. they're shark actual sharks lots of interesting stuff you know winning the lottery to get a house that's above that's that's not going to be flooded you know instead of you know living by the in the slums that are flooded every day when the tide comes in and that was an actual this, true story or fictional this is cli-fi this is the future okay yeah 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 yeah. So there's there's I mean, there, there's a lot of imagination. The stories are only like a thousand words. Right. So you like they got to get to the point. Uh, and it's quite they're, they're, I mean, without my editing, there was a story there with my editing. It got there a little bit quicker is, is was my and my, my goal. Mm. And that's why I mean, that's why I think they're kind of nice just to read them. Yeah. I mean, maybe a little bit depressing because it is about, you know, climate change, which people are trying to ignore. But uh, I don't think that's going to work, that strategy. David, you, you've done a couple of additional research papers that have been published since I was last speaking to you. Yeah. And one of them was on the Dutch drinking water sector, the evolution of the Dutch drinking water sector. Yeah. You wouldn't mind going in on that and touching? I know it kind of crosses a couple of centuries uh, sure. when you look at water civilization, but um, yeah. <laughs> given your, ed- you, given you, your yeah. editing skills, <laughs> could, you <laughs> syn- could you synopsize what this is about and... The reason, yeah. Maybe even the reason why you did it, because it's a collaboration. With, is it with uh, Benet Colin Brander? Is that correct? Yeah. 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 Benet was a was a student who was uh, he was working on a research clinic with me. And I said, Benet, I just finished this paper on on water metering in the in England and Wales, which is a was a hot topic. Right. Yeah. yeah. Still is a hot topic, in yeah. fact. And I said, uh, but that paper was from 1989 from the privatization until around 2015 or so. Right. So I said, I want to look at water meters in the UK, uh, in the Netherlands, where there's too much water. Why would they have water meters at all? Was the starting conversation. And Bene is Dutch, and so he has the, the 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 language skills. And he went into the archives. The first thing he found out is that water meters started getting installed in The Hague in 1880 or so, which is way before I even thought it was possible to meter water. That's right? what I was thinking, yeah. Yeah, yeah, so this tech, I was like, when are they invented? You know, I was like, well, they were clearly invented before 1880. So it was probably like a little oscillator or something like that. that yeah, rotated. totally mechanical. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, it, I'm sure it's like this, you know, genius mechanical works, but the Dutch are very clever about this. So have been what happened now, yeah. is they installed these water meters because guess what? They were running out of fresh water because in in the, in the Netherlands, there's a, a, 
back in the day, they were they were getting water from the sand dunes because the sand dunes would filter the water mm-hmm. and they were pumping it out of the sand dunes to, to sell in the city. And that pumping was was causing a problem because the, the water is being pulled out too quickly. And if it's pulled out too quickly, then your sweet water gets salty because the salt water comes in. Mm-hmm. So they installed the water meters to limit that problem. And then the water meters were uninstalled because there was another group of people who said, you can't meter water. We want uh, people to have use unlimited amounts of water because we, we, we have a thing called water civilization. And so the, the title of the paper, the, the, the working title, we put that, we put that back in with the final uh, version. So it's, it's called water civilization, evolution of the Dutch drinking water sector. And, and so then we got into, okay, so what does this mean, water civilization? So that, that research project kind of, uh, in, in that project, we went over the evolution from 1850 mm-hmm. until 1990. So that's 140 years. And uh, the paper is actually touches on what I was talking about before, the commons, right? Yeah. So it turns out that, that water supply is not just a, a private good. Like a bottle of water is a private good. That's nice and simple. But when you have tap water, it's not private because you're in a community. So it's a, it, there's some kind of community aspect of the water. And because of that, you can't just say we're going to let the market handle it. So the paper was talking about how – Drinking water was managed over four different eras in which different kinds of problems were showing up. So when they first started uh, in 1850, or when we started the paper, that 1850 date was when the first piped water came to Amsterdam. And it was, again, it was a, it was a, a pipe that came from the sand dunes, and people would pay one cent per emmer, so one cent per bucket. That's equivalent to 10 euros a cubic meter today. So that's, you know, in the Netherlands, it's about two, meter, two, two euros a cubic meter today. And back then it was 10 euros a cubic meter. So oh. that cost was a cost that only the rich could afford. Mm. And so people were buying that water and that was good for them, but it was bad for the community that couldn't afford the water, most of the poor people. And this became a common pool discussion, a common pool problem because Cholera and other waterborne diseases were a major problem in, in the Netherlands in the in that period of time, 1850, 1860. And also cholera was a new disease that was starting to be understood, an old disease, but it was starting to be understood. Because, you know, the, the story about John Snow in London, he discovered the connection between cholera and dirty drinking water. This was one a major achievement in science. So the Dutch were reading the papers also, and they realized that their cities were dangerous because of cholera. And so this private water pipe was not going to work. So they decided to build city networks of, of water supplies. And those city networks are super expensive. And they invited in the British to build those pipes because the British were super capitalists and they were making a lot of money in London and they wanted to make more money in the Netherlands. And so they started building networks in the cities and the problem is that the Dutch didn't want them to make that much money, so they put a limit on how much they could charge, and they also required that they have good quality service. And the British basically went bankrupt with this issue, and that meant that those systems were taken over by the cities themselves, the municipalities. Okay. So the first era was the commons of disease. We're going to solve it by having pipe water networks, and then we're going to spend money to make the systems cover the whole community. So we're going to call it a club good. And that created a problem because the people in the countryside were like, what about us? And so the, 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 the commons was, what about, are we citizens? Are we on the same team and so on? And then the, the national government got involved around 1900 and they started subsidizing these networks going across the entire country. And that was great. Cost a lot of money, a massive, like 2% of GDP. And then that got people upset because of the commons of the budget of too much money being spent. And they said, we can't do that anymore. And so they changed the model again around 1950. And then they started saying that the uh, over 200 water companies for the Netherlands, which is maybe the same size as Ireland, like not very big, right? Mm. So 200 different water companies is totally inefficient. I mean, everyone has to have a, a general manager and they have to have a office party for Christmas and so on. So it was a lot of money and the Dutch don't like wasting money. And so what they started doing after 1950, they started consolidating these companies and in a sense, privatizing them, right? Because they, 
they made them a public corporation. So they're owned by the cities. They're not owned by private shareholders, but they're owned by the cities. And so they consolidated 250 water companies to where they have today, 10. Hmm. And they also started, we're back to water meters, they started metering water again because now they want people to pay for the water. And because the technology had advanced over the, 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 the 80 or 100 years, now people could afford to pay. So it was okay to have water meters at the for houses because people could afford to pay two euros a cubic meter, whereas 100 years earlier it was too expensive. So they, they went through these, these eras where we're worried about cholera, we're worried about the countryside, we're worried about wasting money, et cetera, so that the, and, and the system was changing over time. So this paper is tracing that evolution and back and forth between uh, wasting water, wasting money, public health disasters, and so on. So that is what that paper was about. And you said that they had metering earlier on. They got rid of metering. Did it bring it back in then? Yeah, yeah. They just to solve in. all those problems. Yeah. The Netherlands, this is even more funny because the Netherlands is officially 97% metered to households, right? So businesses have had meters forever, but households now are 97% metered. And I'm one of the people that doesn't have a meter. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> That's uh, ironic, isn't it? <laughs> it's it's not always ironic, but it's also it it it's putting it's it's revealing the lie in the water company saying that it's too ex- expensive to install a meter in my house because my house is on a a very normal street in Amsterdam. It could have a water meter, but they didn't install the water meter because I think they just didn't want to. They don't because water companies don't like water meters because it it means that the the consumption going up and down means their revenue goes up and down. And they don't like that. They just want to have steady money every month. So is your payment on for water a fixed amount each year or each month? That's right. Yeah, it's fixed. And do you feel disadvantaged by that or are you happy with that? Um, Depending on I'm, how many showers you I'm take. I'm happy with that. <laughs> no, because when it comes down to it, the, um, there's there there can I, I might end up paying more than if I had a water meter. Hmm. But... On the other hand, my water use or our water use, because I live with my girlfriend, is is pretty constant because uh, we're, we have only indoor use. So toilet, shower, washing, uh, drinking, obviously. And we don't have a garden, right? Yeah. The, at most, we have a plant on the on the balcony, and that's like whatever, two liters a month, <laughs> you know? Yeah, yeah. But if you have a garden, uh, as some Dutch actually do, and they actually water their garden, then that gets more interesting. You should have a meter because... Now you're using water, you're using drinking water for, you know, flowers and plants and stuff. That's nice, but you should definitely pay more for that. Yeah. That kind of leads me on to a paper that Jackie wrote in 2013 called An Economic Apology to Ecology or Should. Yeah. Economy, economy owes ecology and apology. Or yeah, economy. it should be, should be feeding water. You should be feel guilty giving them that two liter bottle of water per month. <laughs> to a plant <laughs> well no that so that's that's well no what we should worry about is uh in, in just in terms of that example is we should worry about okay we're going to take this water and put it on the plant but the cost of water almost anywhere on the planet is zero to the water utility mm-hmm. right so when you can drill a well or when you can put a pump in a river you can take it right mm-hmm. and if you can do that then congratulations you have a, a free input and, you know, as you know, the, the water prices that we pay are, are the prices for the system, for the pipes and for the energy and for the treatment. But the water is, is almost always free with very few exceptions. So if, if the water is free, uh, people are going to use a lot of it. Water managers are not necessarily going to be very careful about protecting natural sources because it's free. Mm. So in that sense, we, uh, we economists – might might owe ecology an apology because sometimes we forget to price nature yeah. uh, and and we know that of course with climate change we're not pricing pollution and atmosphere and so the atmosphere and so we're running into all kinds of problems because of that essentially uh, yeah uh, not pricing that that cost I know, I know that what I'm going to ask here now is more to do with religion and I'm not here to criticize anybody's religion at all because it's this isn't a podcast for and I, I'm not like that person anyway but um, recently there's a report about a group in India. Uh, I think it's uh, based on Fittich. I know there's a Fittich mats and I think it's the kind of same thing. Uh, and they're going to be burning 50,000 kilos of wood that they have stored. 
in order to improve the pollution or it, as a not improve the pollution, but in order to uh, protest against pollution. They're going to burn 50,000 50, kilos, kilos, 50 kilos. tons of wood. Yes, yes. As a protest. I don't know if it's a protest or like an offering to protect or to give back what we have polluted already, which is is kind of, again, I don't want to criticize it. And they're, they're allowed to do it because it's seen as religion and the state doesn't want to intervene in that at all, in that practice. Yeah. yeah. I can't imagine why burning 50,000 kilos of wood that they probably chopped down to prepare sure. for this is going to... I don't know if you could explain that to me. I just don't see the sense in that, unless it's no, only I mean, for I mean, a religious I'll, I'll, perspective. I'm 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 okay with uh, condemning religions for being silly about things, but um, but I think I mean that's it doesn't sound it's so. I know that in India, the most common reason that that wood would be burned for any kind of religious purpose is to uh, cremate a body. Mm. And so that is very common. You know, if you go to, to Benares, Varanasi, there's they're burning body. I saw I've seen this when I was there and they burn the body and that's what they do. And interestingly, cremation is very popular in a lot of developed countries, richer countries for two reasons. One is that it's it's tidy, it's cleaner. And, and the other one is it's, it's really much cheaper than buying a piece of land, you know, in perpetuity. So. Now, if they're going to burn wood as a protest, then, you know, I mean, people do all kinds of crazy stuff as protests. They, they dump a whole truckload of cow shit on the city hall stairs. Farmers, the French <laughs> farmers do this all the time, right? They dump 10,000 liters of milk on the highway to protest something. Yeah. Um, that's not religion. That's protest. So if they're going to do that, I, I, I guess, yeah, they would. But if, if some religion decides that, you know, we're going to, we're going to cut down all this forest because our religion says so. I don't see why uh, a, a law against cutting down the forest would should shouldn't be enforced. I would I would be very happy to enforce that law. Mm. Uh, but there's uh, India's you know what happens in India in the name of religion is you know just a long list of things. So yeah. you never it, know. It's a, I was just looking at it. There, there are Hindus. It's a Hindu ritual. Okay. So um, it, you know, so yeah, just in case. There's a number of religions within the, uh, you know, just, just in case, yeah. just in case <laughs> I have to shut the podcast down. <laughs> yeah. Well, the, you know, the, 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 the ruling party, the BJP is, is, you know, kind of a Hindu chauvinist party. So if, if some Hindus say we're going to do something because of Hindu, then the politicians really are, are stuck. They don't have a lot of choice as far as that's concerned. Yeah. And so that's, that's, uh, that happens quite, a, quite often in countries. And David, there's a, another one that you looked at in Cape Town, for example, the continued failure of water management. Yeah. Is this a problem that we have globally? I know not a majority of people don't have access to fresh drinking water, and that's <laughs> extremely unfortunate. And hopefully we're making inroads there, um, whether it's going to be any major uh, dent or any major improvement over the next 5, 10, 15 years, we don't know. But in countries that have this fresh drinking water or the possibility of accessing it is, is as you, according to you, is failing quite a bit. And you have some evidence on that. Yeah, sure. I mean, it's it's you know what they say sometimes that there's no such thing as a, a food shortage. There's just a food distribution problem because mm. there's enough food on the planet to feed everybody. Yeah. And and that's been talked about a lot. And, and the same is true with water. So. When it comes to water and water services and, you know, water technology, you know, the, the technology of providing uh, clean drinking water is, is very well known. It's very uh, portable. You can bring it into any country. And yet it's not uh, implemented. And if it is implemented, it's not run properly in many, many countries. Right. The, this is a problem of management. And, and the Millennium Development Goals, they said we want to reduce the number of people who they, the, the actual exact words are lack access to an improved water source. And what that means is, as far as the bureaucrats are concerned is that uh, a pipe, which may or may not have water and the water may or may not be drinkable is within, I think, 200 meters of your house if you live in a city. That was their definition. Okay. If you use a definition like a normal person would say, which is lack access to uh, drinkable water, clean water, then, oh, so the first number is there's 900 million people in the, in the world according to the to the UN that lack access to improved water supply uh, source 
And if you say lack of access to clean water, it's more like three billion. Yeah. Yeah. Right. So it's a vastly greater number. And and we're talking about people that, you know, they if they get it out of the tap at all, they boil it, they have to filter it, et cetera. So uh, from everything that I've ever followed, the, the reason that those people don't get access to water falls in two categories. One is that the monopolist, which is in charge of the water supply, and almost always it is a monopolist, can't be bothered. That is essentially it. <laughs> they just don't care. Yeah. Uh, and they don't get penalized for it. The other one, which is quite common, is that they're not allowed to charge for water. And because they're not allowed to charge for water, this is true in India, for example, or they charge, you know, something like uh, 10 rupees a cubic meter. They charge like 20 cents a cubic meter. And the cost of delivery might be, let's say, a dollar a cubic meter. So every cubic meter they deliver, they lose money. Mm. So they have no interest in delivering water because they'll just keep losing money. And that means that people don't get water who are, are connected to the network, or it means that the network doesn't extend to them because that's just losing money. So that's a very common problem in many countries, that the mm. price is so low that the water managers can't expand the network. They have no money. Mm. I ran into this more uh, several times in the ex-Soviet Union. I did consulting in Ukraine and Kazakhstan, and the people were willing to pay for the water. Yeah. They wanted to pay for the water. The companies were there to sell them the water. And the government was saying, you cannot sell them at that price. You have to sell it below the price. So what happens is it, there's no water. Mm. And then people fall back on all kinds of informal sources of water. They drink dirty water from, from bad uh, systems. Very common, they'll, they'll buy water off of trucks that are selling water. And, and all these things cost 10 times more than the actual price they would have to pay if they're paying the full cost. Yeah. So the people who are supposed to be helped by this policy are, are not just hurt because they don't get the water, but they are hurt because they pay 10 times more for the water they have to get. And then, then they get sick, et cetera. Right. So this is to me, it's, it's almost always like 90 percent of the time. These three billion people are, are lacking water because of management failures. David, once again, thanks very much for coming on. A very extended interview and second Pleasure. time. And again, this bonus will go out again in the near future. And as always, you're an economic rock star. Thanks, Frank. And I really appreciate you always give nice comments and, you know, good criticism, feedback and so on on the posts online. And maybe my posts aren't as extensive as they once were, but you're, you're always true to your word. And Well, you're, you know, you're the original economic rock star, aren't you? You're doing this whole, you're, you're the one leading the band, right? Uh, no, I'm more the producer, I'm sure. All right, no, all right, I, all right. I'm not the rock star. <laughs> you're, you're, you're all the rock star. I should do a Sgt. Pepper uh, cover with all your faces on it now. There's so the, many the miscellany. Yeah. yeah, that'd be a good one. It will be a good one, yeah. <laughs> David, once again, thanks very much. Thanks, Frank, for your time, eh? Yeah, and no, thanks for your time. Really appreciate right. it. I'll talk to you right. again soon. Yeah, good. Yeah, I'll be in touch anyway soon. All the best. Can't wait. Yeah, All right. Bye. See you later. Bye. Look, see you. Laters. Bye. Economic Rockstar is a free podcast that does not exclude anyone from listening as long as they have a device to listen, download or stream. I have many listeners from all parts of the world and I truly am pleased to know that the Economic Rockstar podcast unites all of you through the common theme of economics. I strive to commit to releasing an episode each week and aim to develop Economic Rockstar into much more than just a podcast. Patreon is a platform that gives you, the listener of the Economic Rockstar podcast, the opportunity to express your appreciation of the show by committing a financial reward for as little as $1 a month. Patreon allows me, the creator of the Economic Rockstar podcast, to be rewarded and paid by you so I can continue with the running costs of the show and to reinvest and expand the podcast into other platforms or mediums in the future. To find out more on how you can help the Economic Rockstar podcast and have your name added to the supporters list on my website, please check out my Patreon page at patreon.com forward slash economic rockstar or visit the supporters page on the economic rockstar website if you enjoy this podcast why not leave some feedback or comments on the show notes page on economicrockstar.com 
where you can also sign up and be a member of the Economic Rockstar community. If you're listening to this episode on iTunes or Stitcher Radio, I would love to have some feedback and for you to leave an honest rating and review, as this will help with the rankings of the show so that more people can find it. If you're listening on the website economicrockstar.com, make sure you check out the back catalogue of all previous episodes and interviews with some amazing professors and authors at economicrockstar.com forward slash podcasts. Thanks for listening and I really appreciate your loyal support. I know how much you love audio, so why not get a free audiobook with Economic Rockstar today? I've teamed up with audiobooks.com to bring you this amazing offer. Visit audiobooks.com forward slash rockstar to download your free audiobook now.